this month we're going to be talking about verse 29 of Uludu and Apadu. Um, verse 28 and 29, uh, uh, in both these verses, Bhagavan is giving a detailed description of the practice. Though he, um, though he often, in many of the previous verses, he had referred to the practice, he, in these two verses, he's describing it in most detail. Um, the way he describes it in these two verses is very similar. The, um, well, I'll, I'll do, I'll, yes, in, in, the, in the previous verse, the central teaching was, Erum bum ahande, erum idate, kunda matial, ule andu aria vendum. That means um, sinking within uh, uh, by a sharpened mind, it is necessary to know the place where ego rises. By a sharpened mind, he, he means a, a keenly attentive mind. That is, by focusing our attention on ourselves, we need to sink within and thereby know the place where ego rises. Um, what he refers to there as the place where ego rises is uh, our self, our real nature, which is the source from which we rise as ego. Because obviously, um, ego cannot rise from anywhere other than from ourself. Um, e ego is not actually anything other than ourself, but it, it just, it, but, the, um, the ego is a, a false appearance, just like a, a, a rope that seems to be a snake. The ego is just a, a, a misperception. What, 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 if you look at ego carefully enough, we'll see that what it actually is, is only pure awareness, which is our real nature. So it is from pure awareness, from our real nature, that we rise as ego. Uh, so that is what Bhagavan says we should know in the previous verse. He says very much a very similar thing in the, um, in the first sentence of this verse. He says, Nan endru vayal naviladu. That means not saying I by mouth. Ul al manatal. By a mind, by an inward sinking mind, or by a mind sinking within. Nan Indru Engu Undum, uh, where one rises as I, uh, in a Nadle, investigating where one rises as I, Nyana Neriyam, that alone is the path of knowledge. So the whole sentence is Nan Indru uh, Bayal Nabiladu, Ulal Manatal, Nan Indru Engu Undum, in a Nadle, Nyana Neriyam. So he's defining here what is jnana neri, the path of jnana, the path of knowledge. Not saying, so the whole sentence means not saying I by mouth, investigating by an inward sinking mind where one rises as I, alone is the path of knowledge. So just like in the previous verse, he, just, he referred, he said what we need to know is ahande um, erum idate. Or Eram Bumahande Eramidate, where where the, the place where the rising ego rises. Um, in this verse, he, he says we need to investigate Nan uh, Engu um, Undum, where one rises as I. That is, we have risen as I. Where, from where have we risen as I? If we keenly investigate that, that is the path of uh, knowledge. So, in other words, Bhagavan is saying here, the true path of knowledge, the true, true jnana maga, is only the path of self-investigation. Investigating what we are or from where we have risen. Um, in both these verses, Bhagavan is talking about investigating the place from which we rise. The place from which we rise, as I said, is our real nature. So, the, the investigation... Uh, from where do I rise, or where do I rise, or uh, what? Who am I, or what am I? They all meet, They all amount to the same. We're investigating. Um, if we, if we if mistake a, a a rope to be a snake, we can investigate 
if, if we and we want to investigate what the, that snake actually is, if we look at it very carefully, we see it's just a rope. So that is that is investigating what it is. We can also see where did this appearance of a snake come from? The appearance of a snake obviously comes only from the rope. So it, it, in both cases, uh, it, whether Bhagavan describes it as investigating who am I or whence am I or what am I or however, however he describes it, it all amounts to the same thing. It's all investigating this ego and thereby knowing its real nature, that from which it has risen. Um, in this uh, sentence, the means by which we should investigate um, uh, we, we should investigate from where we have, or where we, where we have risen as I, is ul al manatal. That that means um, uh, by a, by a mind, by an inward thinking mind. Ul means within. Our is a, a verb that means um, uh, sinking, subsiding, submerging, diving, plunging, entering, piercing. Mercy being absorbed. So when by sinking within, by subsiding within, but we can only by subsiding within can we investigate what we actually are or, or from where we have risen. So this subsiding within, this is the surrender. That is when we when we see when we give up rising and are ready to subside, that is the surrender aspect of the uh, uh, investigation. But how do we how do we subside within? In the previous verse, he says uh, he uses the same. Here he says ul al manatal. There he says ule andu. Ul al is a um, is a adjectival clause. Ule andu is an adverbial clause using the same two words. Um, so th there he says uh, sinking within. How do we sink within? There he says material by a keen sharpened mind so um, by material implies by a keenly self-attentive mind by being keenly self-attentive we think within and by thinking within we investigate what we actually are so so uh, keenly attending to ourselves and thinking within are actually one and the same thing and that is the means that is the jnana nari the means by which we can know what we actually are. Um, in, um, in verse 25, he said about the ego, Tedinal Otum Pidicum. If sought, it takes flight. Uh, when he says that, um, uh, where, where can the ego take flight? Where can it flee away to? Obviously, it cannot go away from us. It is only by sinking within that the ego takes flight. That is when we, when we keenly attend to ourselves, who now seem to be this ego, ego subsides and dissolves back into its source. Uh, it, 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 it subsidence and sinking back into its source is, uh, and dissolving back into its source is what he refers to here as inward sinking. Um, so there are many, many parallels between uh, this first, the first, this first sentence of this verse and the previous verse. He is in very much the same way he is describing this practice, and he's giving many, many clues. The most important clue is that the way to uh, to make the ego subside is by keenly attending to it. That is, that is the that is the, the very precious practical clue that Bhagavan has given us uh, it may, may have been indirectly implied in, um, in older uh, texts, in older texts of Advaita, but nowhere has been expressed so clearly and emphatically as, as Bhagavan uh, emphasized it. That is the nature of ego, it rises by being aware of other things, by attending to anything other than itself, we rise as ego. By attending to ourselves, we, this ego, subside back into the source from which we have risen, which is what we actually are, our real nature. Uh, so this is, a, these two verses that everyone gives a very clear, a very deep and subtle, very clear 
uh, description of what the practice is. It's nothing but keenly attending to ourselves. That's the significance of the word in the previous verse, kunda matiya. We need a, that is our, our, our power of attention. So long as we are attending to things other than ourselves, since everything other than ourselves is relatively gross, our power of attention gets blunted by attending to other things. So we, uh, with this blunt power of attention, we are not able to look within and uh, clearly discern what we actually are. So we need to sharpen our power of attention. How can we sharpen our power of attention? How can we make our power of attention more keen? It is only by keenly uh, attending to ourselves. That is, the more we, we, we are self-attentive, the more we practice self-attentiveness, the more we try to be self-attentive, the sharper our power of attention will become. And that sharp power of attention is the means by which we sink within and thereby know the place from which we have risen, the source from which we've risen, our own real nature. Um, another important practical clue Bhagavan gave in the Kali Vemba version of this verse, that is he extended this first sentence by adding at the beginning of it an adverbial clause. He told Tim do Uralam, which means leaving or discarding the body like a corpse. And uh, that implies separating oneself from the, from the body as if it were a, cor a corpse, or uh, slightly um, deep way of saying it, ceasing to be aware of it as one would as if it were dead. If, it's, if our body were to die, we would cease to be aware of it. So when Bhagavan says, leaving the body like a corpse, that means we should be completely withdraw our attention from this body and from, from all phenomena and keenly attend to ourselves. This is Bowen is here referring, I mean, he, indirectly, he's referring to what happened to him when he, as a 16-year-old boy in Madurai. In, in, in uh, many books, it is expressed in a rather misleading way, as if Bhagavan said, but he enacted death. He didn't, he didn't enact death. He simply lay down and he withdrew his attention from the body. And, right? well, he focused his attention so keenly on himself that his attention was completely withdrawn from the body. Thereby, the body was left like a corpse. Not only was it, actually, was it left like a corpse, actually, Bhagavan's body became a corpse at that moment because his attention was so keenly uh, focused on himself not only his breath stopped, heart stopped, everything stopped, and the body was just lying there as a death, as, as a lifeless corpse. For Bhagavan said possibly for about 15, 20 minutes, the body was lying there like a like a like a corpse, like a dead, as a dead body. When suddenly the life came back, because it was the divine will, but that body had, had a purpose to serve, to be um, to. to teach us this path of jnana, and um, so for, uh, it was the divine will that that body should continue living, but the one who previously was aware of that body as I am this body, that ego, that had been completely, in, had completely died because Bhagavan had turned his attention, had turned his attention so keenly towards himself but the ego sunk within and thereby dissolved into the source from which it rose. And what remained then was only that source, the place from which it rose, which is pure awareness. So um, uh, people sometimes used to ask Bhagavan, what posture is best for meditation? And um, the word for posture, because generally in yoga and so many of these other spiritual paths, I say it's necessary to sit with a, a straight back and cross-legged or whatever. So the word that is used for posture, physical posture, is asana. So when Bhagavan was asked what, is the, what asana is, ne is best for uh, practicing meditation or self-investigation, Bhagavan said nidhiti asana. Nidhiti asana is deep contemplation. Uh, in this context, uh, when, when used by Bhagavan, nidhiti asana means that keenly, keenly focused self-attentiveness. 
So it doesn't matter what posture of a body is in. Bhagavan's body was just lying down as a corpse. But whatever posture of a body is in need not concern us because we, just like, just as if the body was dead, we have to withdraw our attention from it. When the body is dead, what does it matter whether it's lying or hanging upside down or um, whatever position it may be in, once it's dead, it's dead. So we should, we, we should be so unconcerned about this body. We should be, uh, we, uh, our only concern should be looking within to see what we actually are. So, so keenly we have to draw our attention, uh, that is, uh, focus our attention on ourselves, but it's completely withdrawn from the body, and the, the body is left by, left as a corpse as if it were a corpse. And we have to completely separate ourselves from this body by keenly attending to ourselves. So um, along with this, um, with this uh, um, Kali Vemba extension, Timbal Tindu Udalam, leaving the body as it, um, uh, like a corpse, uh, along with that, the whole of this first sentence is, Pingnam pol tindu udalam, nan endru vayal naviladu, in al manatal, nan endru ingum, endru undum, ena nagale, nyana neriyam. That is, leaving the body like a corpse, not saying I by mouth, investigating by an inward seeking mind, where one rises as I, alone is the path of knowledge. There was one other uh, clause in this sentence that I haven't uh, explained in detail. But one says, um, na, he, the first clause of the main verse is, Nan Indru Vayal Nabiladu, not saying it by mouth. Why Bhagavan says this? Because sometimes when people had difficulty understanding how to investigate uh, themselves, Bhagavan sometimes said, like he said in, um, in Nana, even if one goes on saying I, I, whether by mouth or mentally, even if one goes on uh, uh, thinking I, I, um, that it will lead to that place, that is back to one's own source, to one's own real nature. Why he said that is, when, when we think of any object, say, um, say, um, uh, we think of an apple. When, if I say the word apple, a certain object comes to our, comes to the mind. Or if we say tree, a certain object comes to the mind. Or car, some other object comes to the mind. So any, when we when we say any noun, uh, it, it refers to some object and it brings that object back uh, to our mind at that moment. So when we say the, the word I, it doesn't refer to any object. Though so we often use the what I to refer to this body because we mistake this body to be ourself. Actually, I refers not to an object, it refers to a subject. It refers to the, that which is aware of all objects. So when we, that, that is ourself. So if we, say, if we say mentally or even verbally, if we prefer, I, 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 it, it helps us to draw our attention back towards ourself. But so long as we are thinking I or saying I, we cannot go very deep within because the word I is not ourself. Word I refers to ourself, but it is not, it is not what we actually are. So, um, so though that may be a clue to help us to get started on this path, if we want to go deep, we want to sink deep within, even the word I we have to leave behind. We have to focus our attention only on ourself, that which has risen as I, that which is aware of itself as I. Not the word I, but what is aware of itself as I. That is what we need to investigate. That is why Bhagavan, um, to emphasize how deep we need to sink within, he says, Nan Andrew Vayal Naviladu, not saying I by mouth. That in mouth there, though he says mouth, literally that means the, the physical mouth, but it also means the the mental mouth, so to speak. We're not even to think the word I. Um, we, we should uh, be so keenly, uh, our attention should be so keenly focused on ourselves. That is not to say 
but at early stages it's not beneficial to, to repeat the word I. Bhagavan said that can be helpful at first, but that is not, that is not the way to, that, that will help us get started on the path, but won't help us go very deep into the, into the path. So this, um, so in this uh, first sentence of this verse, but one is very clearly defined. What is the path of knowledge? What, why is this called the path of knowledge? Jnana Neri. Neri is a Tamil word, which means path, or um, equivalent to a Sanskrit word, Jnana. So why is this called the path of Jnana? Because we are seeking to know what we actually are. Know here doesn't mean know in the sense of getting a lot of information about no means being aware of. But this is the path of jnana means knowledge in the sense of awareness. So this, when Bhagavan calls this the path of jnana, it means the path of awareness, a path of by which we can be aware of ourselves as we actually are. Um, then in the next sentence of this verse, he, he, having described what is the actual path of of the chara, of, of jnana, of the chara, uh, he, sa he says, andri. Andri means except or besides or instead. Andri, andru idu nan adu, uh, nan am adu, andru unal tuneyam. That means instead, thinking uh, not this, I am that, is an aid. That implies, uh, uh, instead of investigating, keenly investigating ourselves like this, thinking, I am not this, I am that. That is, I am not this body or mind, I am that Brahman. That may, that, that is an aid, but, he, uh, uh, but only an aid. Because as he says in the next, in the final sentence, Adu Vichara Mama, is it investigation? That is, these two sentences really are to be read, uh, together as one. That, that, that what they mean is thinking, I, instead of investigating what we are, thinking I am not this body, I am that Brahman, is an aid, but is it vichara? When Bhagavan asks, is it vichara? That is, is it investigation, in the sense of self-investigation? Um, it's, it's a rhetorical question. He obviously implies it's not self-investigation. So thinking, um, before Bhagavan came, for hundreds of years, people not clearly understanding what the what is the means to uh, to, uh, uh, to to attain jnana, not clearly understanding from the ancient text what is the correct means to attain jnana. Many people thought we have to uh, meditate. I am not this body. I am not this that prana. I am not this uh, mind. I am not this intellect. I am not this uh, will. That is to, to reject all these things and to think I am that, I am Brahman. But Bhagavan said that may be an aid. That is, we need to understand that we are not this body or mind or will or anything. We are only that which is, well, we, at, the, at present, we are the witness of all these things. That is, we, the ego, are that which is aware of body, mind, and things. These are all objects. We are the subject. But we, we have to go even deeper in our investigation. First, we have to distinguish the subject from all objects. That is, we have to distinguish the seer from what is seen, the perceiver from what is perceived. Body, mind, uh, intellect, will, all these things are things perceived by us. So they are not what we actually are. They appear and disappear in our awareness. Even our desires and our likes, our dislikes, all these things, they are not what we actually are. They are, they, desires arise in our awareness. Thoughts and memories arise in our awareness. The body arises in our awareness. So we are present whether these things appear or they don't appear. So at present we seem to be the subject who is aware of them, the perceiver of them. But if we look very carefully at ourselves, the perceiver, then we will, this perceiver will sink within, dissolve back into its source, because the perceiver is only ego, and what will then remain, that is Brahman. So, thinking, I am not this body or mind, that is necessary first. First, we need to clearly understand that we are not anything that is perceived. We are not anything, we are not any object. 
We are the subject. That's first we have to understand that. We are the witness. We are that which is aware of all these things. But why we need to understand that? Because what do we focus our attention on? We focus our attention on ourself, the seer, not on anything that is seen. So understanding that we are not this body or mind, that is a that is a preliminary. That is first we have to understand that before we can even begin to investigate what we are. Otherwise, if we think we have a body or mind, we'll be attending to the body or mind and not to ourselves. And also, uh, uh, I am that. Why we are told, uh, why the, um, why, uh, the ancient texts say you are that, as Bhagavan implies in some later verses of Urinaptu, when it is said you are that, what should be our reaction? That means Brahman. Generally, people, generally, we take God to be something other than ourselves, God or Brahman or whatever, the, the ultimate reality. We take it to be something other than ourselves. So we are seeking it outside ourselves. So the reason why the Upanishads say, you are that, is to make us turn our attention back to ourselves. Uh, to, to investigate what we ourselves actually are. If, if I am that, if I am Brahman, then how do I know Brahman? Simply, in order to know Brahman, I don't have to go outside in search of Brahman, because I am Brahman. I just have to know what I am. So by investigating myself, that is the way to know Brahman. So the reason we are told you are that, you are Brahman, is to turn our attention away from the thought of Brahman back towards ourself, uh, which is that to which the word Brahman actually refers. Some, some pundits and people who are very learned in Advaita but haven't understood it correctly, they uh, give lectures saying it is not sufficient. When, when it is said, Tatvamasi, you are that, it is not sufficient only to investigate only Tvum. One needs to investigate Tvum and then one needs to investigate Tat. But if Tat is Tvum, if we are that, we, we can forget about that and we can investigate ourselves because that is nothing other than ourself. So if Brahman is nothing other than ourself, we can. We, can, we, we no longer need to be concerned about Brahman. We need to know what we are. If we know what we are, we know what Brahman is. So they investigating, since, uh, since we are that, investigating ourselves is investigating that. It's not two separate investigations. So the only way to investigate that is to investigate ourselves. So it is to to turn our attention away from the thought of God or the thought of Brahman back towards ourself, which is that to which the word God or Brahman actually refers. Um, the term God or Brahman, what it truly refers to is our real nature, what we actually are. So in order to know that, we need to investigate ourselves. So merely thinking, I, I am not this body or mind, I am that Brahman, that may be an aid, but that is not the vichara. Having understood that we are not this body or mind, we are only Brahman, we then need to investigate ourselves. How do we investigate ourselves? By leaving the body like a corpse, not saying I by mouth, investigating with, a keenly in, in, with an inward seeking mind, that is a mind that's sinking within by kundamati, by a, uh, by a keen, uh, 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 keenly focused power of uh, attention to investigate from where or uh, where we have risen as I. That is, what is what is the source from which we've risen? That is only ourself. So we need to give up all thought about body, mind, Brahman, all other things. We need to focus our attention only on ourselves. That is what Bhagavan is emphasizing in this verse. Michael, uh, thank you for this uh, very good explanation of the verse. Uh, several questions came to my mind. They're not very organized, not very crisp. <laughs> and I think principally we think in terms of words that we associate meanings to it. And uh, the closest to I am that is that I am I or I I. 
And it seems a little circular, and maybe that's the intention to be aware of the awareness itself, or subject is aware of the subject, trying to be aware of the subject. I think that is the intention. But it would also help to know if there is, I can see the uttering this is inferior to thinking about it or meditating about it because it points in the mind inward till it dissolves or sinks wherever it needs to go. But is there any, what is the difference between thinking deeply and attending? I think there must be a subtle difference of attention or being aware of. And is there any more crisp uh, um, thinking? Uh, the, the first thought, thought originates from the rising of I, the rising of ego. So ego is the first thought. The subject is the first thought. All the objects, all the phenomena are other thoughts. So um, there is, in a sense, there's no difference between attending and thinking. When we, when, we, when we think of something, we are attending to the idea of it. But according to Bhagavan, a, a thing and the idea of it are not actually different. Even, even the perception of something, okay, there is a difference between thinking of an apple and seeing an apple. But they're both, thinking of an apple is perceiving it in one way, perceiving it inwardly. Uh, seeing an apple is... Is, uh, is, is another type of perception of the apple. Eating the apple is yet another type. So, but they're all, all perception, according to Bhagavan, is nothing but thought. It's all different ways of thinking about it. So, um, so there, there are gross levels of thought and subtler levels of thought. And when we attend to anything other than ourselves, our, our attention, our thought is gross. When we turn our attention or our thought back on ourselves, when we try to attend only to ourselves, the ego itself begins to subside, and thus we, the, the self attentiveness is far more subtle than any other type of thought. We can, it's, whether we describe it as a thought or a state of free of thought, it's arbitrary, it's not completely free of thought because we, we are completely free of thought only when ego is completely dissolved back into its source. But this turning of the ego, the ego turning its attention back on itself, that is the subtlest type of thought. That is what Bhagavan refers to in um, the sixth paragraph of Who Am I, where he says, the thought who am I, just like just like a stick used for um, for stirring a, um, a, a corpse on a cremation, uh, j just like that stick, the thought who am I will destroy all other thoughts, and it will eventually itself be destroyed. So the subtlest of all thoughts is this: what he calls there the thought who am I. He's not talking about the the, the words who am I. The, the thought who am I means the, the keenness with which we attend to ourselves, the love with which we attend to ourselves, that, um, that is what you refers to the thought who am I. So that self-attentiveness is the thought who am I. So that self-attentiveness will destroy all other thoughts and will itself eventually be destroyed. Thank you. I think it's really intensive. Yes, yes, yes. It's very, very subtle. We, with words we can describe to a certain extent, but the, the meaning of the words becomes clearer the more we put it into practice. So there can be no substitute for practice. But in order to understand Bhagavan's teachings, we, can read, it's, we need to read them, we need to think deeply about them. But merely reading them and thinking deeply about them will not give us a deep understanding of his teachings. We can get a deep understanding of his teachings only, only by um, keenly investigating ourselves.
Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. I had a question, general question, and um, that is like in each uh, investigation session, self investigation session, uh, how long should, should, should I try to build for? It? How long should it last? Bhagavan says, Nirantara Swarupa Smarana, uh, unceasing self remembrance. So ideally, we should, there should be a background of self-attentiveness going on, on all the time. But when we, in the midst of our other activities, whatever we are doing takes up a certain amount of our attention. So even though we may be able to hold on to a, a certain level of self-attentiveness, even in the midst of other activities, that is not very deep. When we need to go very deep within. In order to go deep enough within to see what we actually are, we just need one, one moment, one, the minutest moment of absolutely clear, absolutely clear self-attentiveness and the ego will be destroyed entirely. So it is not the duration, but <coughs> it's the intensity of, of uh, attention. So two things have to go on hand in hand. We need to, throughout the day, we need to be trying to, as much as possible, to hold on to self-attentiveness, at least to a certain extent. And then when we are free from other uh, demands, other demands on our attention, we should try to go as deep within as we can. So, it, it, it's but one never prescribed to uh, sit for 20 minutes morning and evening or anything like that. But but one didn't prescribe anything, he just said, Know what you are, investigate yourself, see what you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, if we told to see the sun, how long do we have to look at the sun to see it? We just need to turn towards it, and just one moment is enough. We'll see the sun and we'll be blinded. Finished. So if we look at the sun of self-knowledge, the, 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 the pure, the clear self-awareness that is shining in our heart, if we look at it directly, that is if we turn the full 180 degrees, so to speak, away from other things, back towards ourselves, in a moment, this ego will be destroyed. Why, why a duration of practice is necessary? Because we are not yet willing to turn that 180 degrees. Because turning 180 degrees means letting go of everything else. Letting go of it, not just temporarily, letting go of it permanently. We let go of everything when we fall asleep at night. Because we're confident we're going to wake up again the next morning. But turning our attention 180 degrees back towards ourselves, that means letting go of everything else once and for all, permanently, forever, that we are not yet willing to do. So we, it's, it's our lack of willingness that makes it seem difficult, that makes it seem necessary to practice for a long time. But the more we practice, the more willing we will become to turn within, the more willing we will become to surrender ourselves completely. So we need to practice for as long as it takes for us to be willing to surrender ourselves completely. If you can do that in 20 minutes, then 20 minutes is enough. If you can do it in 20 seconds, 20 seconds is enough. But for most of us, because we are not yet, because even for someone like Bowen, who was able to do it in one second, he said it was a resumption of what was done in previous births. He said, no, uh, Atmanyana is not our birthright. It has to be earned. We all have to do what is necessary. That is, we have to wean our mind away from its attachments to all other things. That takes years or maybe even lifetimes of practice. We, are all, we don't know how far along. We, we, we are where we are now because of what we practiced before. So we've come to a certain point and we don't know how far ahead we have to go. It doesn't matter where on the path we are. We know which direction we have to go in. That is back towards ourselves. So let us try as much as possible to go back towards ourselves, to turn our attention back towards ourselves. 
whether the goal is one mile away, a hundred miles away, or ten light years away, it doesn't matter. We're going in the right direction. That is just proceed. Because we're not going to get to our goal without proceeding in the right direction. So it's immaterial whether the goal is near or far. So long as we're on the right, going in the right direction, that's all that's necessary. We don't have to worry about when am I going to reach there. Keep on going in the right direction, and sooner or later we'll surely reach there. We can't get there any quicker than by going in the right direction. Taking any other direction is just delaying us. So the direction is to turn our attention towards ourselves, to surrender ourselves completely to Bhagavan. That is the direction we must go in. Frequency is more important than innovation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Frequency and perseverance. Patient perseverance. That leads to the next question. Uh, we, after studying all this, uh, all this time, uh, and the verse after verse, and from different uh, textbooks, we have learned that uh, we are not the body. The body is insentient. After realizing that fact, what more do you need to say the same thing again and again? What is the point in uh, repeating the same thing again and again? Uh, in, in the course of the day, we attend to so many things. So many things are making an impression on us. We have so many cares and concerns. We, the, this body seems to be ourself. We seem to have a family. We seem to have uh, duties and responsibilities. These make us think of so many things. And we, we need to earn a living, we need this and that. So we, we are caught up in samsara, constantly attending to things other than ourselves. And everything other than ourselves that we attend to is making an impression on our mind. So we are now, in the spiritual path, we are trying to wean our mind away from its cares and concerns about other things, what we should care about, what we should be concerned about is only knowing ourselves. But in this process of weaning our mind away, because we don't yet have sufficient love to attend to ourselves all the time, much of the time we're attending to other things. While we're in the midst of attending to other things, constantly uh, you know, frequently reading Bhagavan's teachings, thinking about Bhagavan's teachings, is encouraging us and helping us to turn our attention back towards ourselves. Moreover, uh, there's another reason. Supposing you're learning some, you're learning some new skill. You may read the theory and then you try and put it into practice. But when you put it into practice, you have some difficulties. So then what you do, you go back to the theory and you read again and try and get a better grasp of what you're trying to do. And then you try and, every time you try to put it into practice, when you go back to the theory, but what you have read in the books earlier makes more sense because you've actually tried to put it into practice. It's exactly the same with this. Bhagavan's teachings are very, very subtle, very, very deep in meaning. Though they're very simple, they're not complicated, but they're very deep and very subtle. So when we first read them, we understand to a certain extent, but our understanding is still relatively superficial. But the more we put them into practice, the more our understanding deepens. And when we read them with a deeper understanding, we get more from them. So, that is why it is said, repeated sravana, manana, and nidityasana. Sravana means the reading. Uh, manana means thinking about it, trying to, making connections. Bhagavan said this here, he said this here, what's the connection? That is, getting a coherent understanding. Everything should fit in place. But actually, Bhagavan teaching, they're so, so simple. If we, if we understand the the basic principles of the teachings, everything fits into place. Everything holds together as a coherent whole. But that understanding the connections between different things, but different um, elements of the teaching 
is, is, that is what Manana is all about. And understanding why is it so? Why does Bhagavan say that this world is just a dream? What, how can we, well, why, why should we believe this world is just a dream? It seems to be so real. So we need to think carefully about, do we have any reason to believe that it's anything other than a dream? So we need to think very deeply about what Bhagavan taught us. But our thinking, our, thinking deep, our thinking will become deeper and subtler the more we put it into practice. Because when we put it into practice, that, putting it, that thinking about it is the manana, putting it into practice is the nidhiti asana. The more we put it into practice, the greater, the more our mind is purified, clarified. And with that greater clarity, we can see more depth, more meaning in his teachings. So we, 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 we're not just to repeat his teachings like a parrot. We are, we, that, 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 that would be just like a reading again and again and again. We need to think about what we're reading. We need to, to, to assimilate it. We may need to make it part and parcel of our whole outlook on the world. But in order to, to really absorb it deeply, we need to put it into practice. The more we put it into practice, the deeper will be our ability to absorb the meaning, to really grasp the meaning. Because what the subject Bhagavan is talking about is a very, very subtle subject. The words he uses are the best words possible, but those words are only pointed. The words cannot adequately convey. <laughs> so it's only by the... the, uh, by the putting it into practice, but we get the clarity to understand what is behind the words, what is the real, what is Bhagavan is really talking about. Because he, Bhagavan uses very, very simple everyday words. A place where, where the rising ego rises. Place means we, we think of, uh, our immediate reaction is to think of a physical place. Oh, it rises somewhere in the body, so two digits to the right from the center of the chest. We, we tend to have a, give a gross interpretation of things, but that is not what Bhagavan's talking about. He's using the word place in a metaphorical sense. The place from which it rises is that from which it rises. From where does ego rise? This body comes only after ego, so it, ego can't arise. It, it seems to arise in this body, but actually, body arises only after ego. So from where does ego rise? Only from ourself. So what is, who am I from whom this ego has risen? We need to turn our thing. So the, the meaning of Bhagavan's words become clearer and uh, the, the depth of meaning in them becomes more apparent the more we put them into practice. So Sravana Manana Nidityasana until ego is finished, these are not finished. There's still room for us to deepen our understanding. And the deeper understanding will enable us to go deeper in the practice. So each feeds the other. The sravana feeds the manana. The manana needs, feeds the nididhyasana. And the nididhyasana feeds both sravana and manana. So each is feeding each of the other two. Does that uh, answer your, uh, your question adequately? Yes, yes. Uh, it, it is mainly to, it's uh, provoking the thought, so to speak. Yes. Uh, uh, because uh, ultimately, uh, one has to realize for oneself, uh, you know, the theory part we understand easily, but uh, putting it into practice and uh, uh, Even, un even and understanding the theory, uh, it's easy to understand the theory superficially, but to understand it deeply, uh, if we do, we really un do any of us really understand what Bhagavan says? Bhagavan says there's no happiness at all in any of the things of the world. Happiness lies only within. Happiness is your real nature. We have any of us really understood that? We understand it at a superficial level, but if we had really understood it. Our attention would only go within, it wouldn't go out, because we, we're all seeking happiness. 
So why should we, if there's no happiness in any of the things in the world, why should we attend to anything? Why should we attend to anything other than ourselves? The fact that we're attending to anything other than ourselves shows we haven't yet understood Bhagavan correctly, deeply. Our understanding is still relatively superficial. So we shouldn't think understanding Bhagavan, Bhagavan's things are very simple, but to understand them deeply takes time and practice. It takes Sravana, Manu, and Nidityasana repeatedly. So I have another question on that, um, Michael. Um, you mentioned in one of your other sessions, uh, previous sessions, that if you make progress uh, towards this path, that progress uh, is always maintained. But uh, it seems like when we tend to the ego, when we tend to get this stuff, sometimes we get uh, so um, you know entangled with it that it seems like we have lost progress. Is that not true? It, it may see, it may seem so it may seem so but um, because our view of our, we 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 are seeing things from a very limited view we are seeing only what's happening on on the we are aware of of our desires our vasanas only when they rise to the surface of our mind but we we, we, we this whole process this whole a path of Sravana Manana Nidityasana. This is a cleansing process. So when, when, when you're cleaning, more and more dirt comes from, uh, dirt which lay hidden with beneath the surface comes to the surface. Uh, Sadhuam used to say, if you've got, if you've got a, a, a bucket full of um, water with lots of par dirt particles in it, if you're constantly stirring that bucket, the, the dirt is evenly spread throughout. But if you stop stirring it, allow it to be quiet, the dirt floats up to the surface. Likewise, when we, when we turn our attention within and try to be quiet, when we try to be just calmly self-attentive, all the dirt that is inside rises up to the surface. So sometimes we seem to be going backwards rather than forwards. We seem to be getting worse. But this is all part, and Bhagavan, when people say, oh Bhagavan, so many thoughts come to me when I'm meditating. Bhagavan said, if they don't come out, how are you going to get rid of them? <laughs> they have to come out. So all the dirt inside has to come to the surface and be rejected. So we, we, we cannot measure our own progress. We cannot tell how far we are from our goal. And that shouldn't, pre that shouldn't concern us because we know we, we want to reach our goal. Whether, whether, it's, whether it's far away or near, we want to reach it. So our attention should be on the journey, on following the path. When the goal will come, we can leave that to Bhagavan. That need not concern us. Our concern is to follow the path he showed us. Bhagavan said in the 12th paragraph of, of, of Nana, those who have come within the glance of a guru's grace, they're like a prey caught in the jaws of a tiger, those who have been caught by the glance of a guru's grace will surely be saved and never forsaken. Any known guru katya varipadi tavarada nanikavendam. However, it, it, is, uh, it is necessary to follow without fail uh, or uh, with, with yeah without fail the path shown by guru so that is what we have to do we have to focus on following the path let the goal take care of itself very nice thank you But this practice is slowly the love increases right the love to the yes love. yes definitely and, that's and along with the love, the veragya, the freedom from desire for other things, that is a, 
the strength of our desires and attachments and our fears and our hopes and our likes and our dislikes, they will become weaker and weaker. That is, our vairagya will become stronger. And that vairagya is the, as Bhagavan said, it's the stone that we need to tie to our waist in order to sink deep within. Bhakti and Vairagya are the same thing, two sides of the same point. To the extent that we love to know ourselves, to that extent will we, we, will we be free from desires or likes or dislikes or anything else, cares, concerns. These will all dissolve to the extent that our love to know ourselves increases. And our love to know ourselves will increase to the extent that we but we sincerely follow the path that Bhagavan has shown us, trying to be self-attentive, trying to surrender ourselves. We've silenced our questions. <laughs> that is the best condition. I wish I could silence my mind as easily as I've silenced your mind. <laughs> Albeit for a brief moment. <laughs> yes, that is a problem. <laughs> but in practical sense, in a practical sense, what I find is in this mundane samsara, the more we become uh, spiritualized or uh, practice this, uh, I think the more uh, our ability to accept the things as they are is increasing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think if there is any the surrender, the surrender and the vichara, we cannot have one without the other. The more we investigate what we are, the more indifferent we will be to other things less we'll be uh, concerned about other things. Okay, we all know life is full of pleasures and pains. There's so many things we have to undergo in life. But why should we be concerned about those? What we should be concerned about is only turning our attention within and sinking within to know what we actually are. Um, Michael, so uh, this is you know, some, some, for some people, they just need a lot of, uh, there's they, just too many obstacles. So, just give you an example. Um, a few years ago, we had a devotee. Um, she, um, um, I think she's an immigrant from uh, one of the South American countries. Um, and um, she, she, she she started coming uh, to the satsang. She was really affected by Bhagavan's teachings. Um, and um, after a few sessions, she she couldn't make it. So and we had a conversation on the phone, and um, she said her husband is is. is really asking her why she's getting deviated um you know she's she's getting into you know different path and so forth and sort of a uh, an emotional um blackmailing or whatever you may want to call it yeah yeah like a word yeah and, uh, it just um, and then she which was really uh it, it hit her hard and then she couldn't really make it after that so this is uh, what incident has always been in my mind for many years, and and then over the years I see this phenomena repeating um, for some people. Um, what the, uh, I know it's a difficult question, but it's sort of an enigma. How more so for people who are from backgrounds other than the Vedic faith, you know? So just it seems to be being put through this um, sort of a pain. Uh, how how is it, how can they get the strength? Um, 
everything that happens in our external life, our, our, the external circumstances of our life, are all according to destiny. Sometimes they may seem to be an obstacle to us on this path, but actually, Bhagavan's path is a path of surrender. So it's possible, nobody, nobody can prevent us from following this path. Because nobody need even know we are following this path. So even in the midst of the most adverse circumstances, we can have, we can have our family opposing us in so many ways, either directly or in many subtle, indirect ways, the family can oppose. But we, if we are steadfast in our practice, they need not even know what we are doing. So Bhagavan used to say, prarabdha affects only the outward term mind. Prarabdha can never prevent us turning our mind within. So long as we look outwards, the, 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 the film we have to watch is already predetermined. But why to watch the film? We should stop watching the film and watch the watcher. The, the film cannot change the watcher. So we have to turn our attention back towards ourselves, the one who, who was previously watching the film. We draw our attention from the film, the, the dream of this life, and uh, focus our attention on ourselves. We can do that whatever the circumstances may be. Outwardly, some circumstances may seem to be more difficult, but Bhagavan knows why, is it, why he gives us those difficulties. Maybe to increase our vairagya, to increase our surrender to him. So whatever circumstances we are in now are the best circumstances for us now. And whatever circumstances we're going to be in next year will be the best circumstances for us then. Bhagavan knows what is best for us, better than we know for ourselves. Michael. Yes. Um, so it was interesting. Um, it struck me when you said it's not our birthright um, yes. to know ourselves. Yes. Why is that? Because it seems like everything else is given to us freely, what we need to survive and live, like, you know, everything. Everything is happening without, it's all given freely. Why is this one thing that's one essential, like the crux of it all, why is that not given to us freely? Well, when, when Bhagavan said it is not our birthright, he could also have said it is our birthright because we are that. But what he meant by saying it is not our birthright means it is ours for the asking. If we really want it, we can surrender our ego here and now. The reason we don't surrender our ego is we are not yet willing to do so. So we need to cultivate that willingness. That willingness cannot be given to us. We ourselves need to cultivate it. Can Bhagavan not make us more willing? Hmm? Can Bhagavan not make us more willing? Bhagavan is doing his part. We have to do our part. We, we, we are saying, Bhagavan, Bhagavan, can you not feed me? And we're closing our mouth. <laughs> he has to open it then. <laughs> he's trying, but we're resisting. And he's very, very gentle. <laughs> he, he, Bhagavan, Bhagavan could kill us at this very moment, but that would be murder. Until we are ready to submit ourselves, he will not kill us. So guide the stone of Bhairagya in your waist and take time. Exactly. Don't even try to come up. <laughs> Isn't that true, Michael? <laughs> yes. Surrender. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa used to say, the grace of three people are necessary. The grace of God, the grace of Guru, and the grace of Jiva. The grace of the grace of God and grace of Guru is always available. It's the grace of Jiva which is lacking. 
think the grace of Jiva will always be lacking. <laughs> it will never be on par with the grace of Guru or God. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. The more we subside, the less obstacle this jiva will be. By turning within, we are opening our heart to the flow of grace. So Bhagavan's grace is always waiting to enter our heart. But we need to open the door. And we open the door by turning our attention within. Grace, grace, grace will do everything for us. We just have to stop resisting. In other words, we have to surrender ourselves completely. So we are now training ourselves to surrender. That's what this path is about. Self-investigation is the way to learn how to surrender ourselves. So I have just one question, Michael. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm finding that I that it is getting easier not to listen to the chatter. I, I, I um, what's happening is that you know, like you said, you, you it's like unceasingly, like the Bible says, unceasingly praying. That's how I look at it. I just kind of unceasingly, wherever I am, I'm looking within. But it seems like when I'm still. Or when I'm even sitting, like I, I was at a restaurant, I, and I just kind of before I ate, I just kind of went in, and you know, and and even at the restaurant, I find myself going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the two, the, the the conversation is 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 not as much in my head, but I'm 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 going to sleep. Am I getting anything out of it? I mean, I'm. I mean, how can I? Then, when I make sure I get eight hours, I'm still yeah. kind of okay. There, there, there are two obstacles on this path. Okay. One, one is thought, and the other is sleep. <laughs> we, we, we need to remain balanced in the state between sleep and thought. The state of thought is called waking and dream. We, in waking and dream, we're attending to things other than ourselves. When we try to withdraw our attention from ourselves, then the next defense mechanism for ego is to fall asleep. So we shouldn't allow ourselves to fall asleep and we shouldn't allow ourselves to fall into uh, thoughts. So we need to remain balanced between thought and sleep. That is what is called the state of wakeful sleep. Just swinging from one side to the other. <laughs> <laughs> but when a, pendulum, when a pendulum is swinging, if you don't continue pushing it, slowly, slowly it'll come to a standstill. So we need to, that's why we need patience and perseverance. Okay, okay I have a question. Yes. Hey, Michael. Hello. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's about the, the body. The body is said in sentient. Uh, yes. uh, it cannot say I. Yes. In the case of Jesus Christ, when he was being crucified, he was crying out to God. Yes. And one reason was given to that question was that was only the reactions of his body, not his, his spirit or his God. So how do we, how do you explain uh, that in relation to the concept that the body is in sentient? Um, so long as, so long as the body is alive, it responds to stimuli. Even, even if, for example, suppo supposing a body, uh, there's a body in coma, and you give it an electric shock, it will wince. There's no one there that is aware of that, but still the body has its own reactions. That doesn't mean the body is aware, it's just responding to stimuli. 
So responding to stimuli is not a sign of awareness. Even a computer, if I press a key on my computer, if I click the, the cross on the top of this screen, you'll disappear because the, I'll, be cutting, I'll be closing this application. So the, the computer responds to my stimuli, but that doesn't mean the computer is aware of anything. So insentient things can respond to stimuli without being aware. What is aware of all these things is ego. So when Jesus Christ was crying out to God, that was not his ego or his him um, who was actually well, crying out just in his body? We, we, we don't know what state Jesus Christ was in. If, if we assume that he was a nyani, but there was no ego there, then it was just the, the response of that body, yes. But he was saying, I. So that means that the body says, I. Uh, you, you, can, you can program a computer to say I. <laughs> the computer is not aware of I. When Bhagavan says the body does not say I, he's not taught, he, he's using the word say there in a metaphorical sense. When he says the body does not say I, he means the body is not aware of itself as I. 